Good evening, everyone, and welcome to We Got Next, the second in our summer salon series hosted here at the College of Fine and Applied Arts at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. This is our series highlighting the work of our outstanding Black faculty and extended community here in the College of Fine and Applied Arts, and we're happy to bring this to you along with our partners, the Krenert Museum of Art and the Krenert Center for the Performing Arts. This series is conceived and led by our host, uh, Indolyn Taylor, that you'll meet in a minute. And I'm here at home, like I hope a lot of you are, and just eager to join along here. But I wanted to introduce this series first and give you a little background about where it came from. My name is Kevin Hamilton, and I'm the Dean of this College of Fine and Applied Arts, where it's my great privilege to work alongside a tremendous amount of outstanding Black faculty who are artists, researchers, and civic members who are contributing in their work across these spectra. We're doing this process, this project for a few different reasons. And I just wanna name a few right now before I take you over to our Credit Art Museum where our guests are waiting this evening. As you might guess, an institution like ours is focusing on a series like this, certainly because we need to turn our light more often on black excellence. We've not done enough of that in the past. We need to do it more. And a lot of institutions are there right now, I'm glad to see across our dimensions, uh, across entertainment and the arts, we're seeing more and more attention highlighted on the excellent work of black artists. We're also doing this work because a lot of us have a lot to learn about how to make spaces like ours, institutions like ours, classrooms like ours, spaces where black artists and researchers can truly thrive. To be clear, this is the work of white folks to dismantle white supremacy that is organizing these spaces all too often. And an event like this, a series like this helps us to learn more about this by exposing what we hear and see in our world around us. One of the aspects of the vision of this series that Endelin Taylor has brought us is an invitation to our great black artists and researchers to talk about not only the work they've created in the past, but how it helps them process what's going on in this unprecedented summer of rising awareness, finally, of the pandemic of structural racism around us. So we're here to learn about that more this evening as well. But really one of, I think, the top priorities why we're doing this series and something I wanna bring into this conversation tonight based on even with the great things that happened last week is that we're doing this series to promote and enable more spaces of black joy, creativity, and visioning of the future. The history of black arts is a history of those spaces where black artists created spaces as they did in the Harlem Renaissance and the dance halls and music halls, as they did in the street fests of Brooklyn and Queens where hip hop came to be. These spaces of black joy, of black hope, of black creativity and visioning have contributed to some of the most impactful art forms of this planet and that are all over the world, helping us see the way to the future. Black folks had to create these spaces because in many times, in many instances, institutions like ours were excluding their forms of expression, their forms of speech and lifting up white ways as the norm. We are actively working to change that but until we have, and maybe even beyond, we need to keep enabling spaces like you're gonna to see tonight of Black-led imaginings about the future of Black hope and joy and sharing. I'm so grateful and honored that we have amazing colleagues in this college that have a history of these spaces, that are some of the national experts at how these spaces come to be, how we promote them, what we can learn from them. And boy, do we need them more than ever right now to hear about these visions of the future that have emerged from these spaces. So I'm most grateful to our host tonight, Endelin Taylor, for visioning this series, for all of our guests that are going to join us tonight. And I'm grateful to you, listeners and viewers, for joining us this evening as well as a part of this series and this beginning of what I hope is a new era for our college and our university as well. So thank you. I hope you're comfortable at home. Settle in for a great conversation. And I want to take you now over to our great Krenner Art Museum, where Endelin Taylor and our guests stand ready to set up a great evening for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everybody. And as Kevin said, this space is a space for imagining. Um, it is also a space for acknowledging the shoulders that we stand on. And it is also a space to talk about the here and now. We're going to do all of those things today. And we'll start with a little bit of history. And I'm so excited to be here tonight with my two um, colleagues and friends and guests, Joyce McCall, who comes to us from the School of Music. She is going to talk about W.E.B. Du Bois and also tell us a little bit about herself. Okay. And um, yeah, let's start. Let's just go. Right. So I am 
originally from Mobile, Alabama, and I'm actually finding out that a lot of people who look like me are from elsewhere, and we tend to migrate in various spaces, or to various spaces. Um, my work in terms of research has to do with looking at race and racism, and using lenses like critical race theory and double consciousness theory to look a bit closer, more like a micro, microscopic lens, um, and to assess the, the ways in which equity presents itself in particularly music education um, for, for specific populations and how equity is not always provided to other populations, particularly uh, students of color and first generation Americans. And we have to also consider along the lines of socioeconomic status. So my work too has been influenced or even inspired by my own experiences as being always one of few or the only in almost every space um, in education from middle school all the way up until now and also observing other people's experiences of negotiating spaces as being one of few and the only. So that has inspired my work, particularly along, especially voice, because I'm finding there's a lack of, of black voices, as uh, Kevin mentioned, and that, that brings us to this place to elevate those voices. So that's a bit about me. <laughs> Great. So I guess I'll go ahead and start. A mirror, in the simplest sense, is an inanimate object that with the help of light reflects surfaces of images placed before it, yielding a virtual real-time mirroring of both movement and stillness. Mirrors are commonly used to assist in grooming and admiring oneself and to determine spatial awareness, locating objects in our rear and peripheral. In architecture, mirrors are used to increase light and extend depth in small dim spaces. However, an infinity mirror created when two or more mirrors are placed across from each other manifests a series of reflections that appear to reverberate seemingly forever. For this paper, I adopt the latter delineation of an infinity mirror as a metaphorical tool to assert that the reflections of W.E.B. Du Bois's path into a predominantly white institution over 130 years ago lingers well into the 21st century. Similar to how light assists in manifesting reflections of images placed before the mirror, I extend the metaphor of the mirror by using racism as the light that aids in sustaining the experiences of Du Bois and three men in the 21st century. By placing images of Du Bois's accounts alongside other African Americans, Similar to those encountered by Du Bois in front of the mirror, America's protracted legacy of racism throughout generations can be realized. Given that Du Bois' double consciousness theory is an extension of his experiences, I employ it as a lens to, a zoom lens to focus in and out of the reflections produced, detailing the similarities and differences of racial injuries endured by Du Bois and African Americans today in predominantly white music programs in the United States. William Edward Burkhart Du Bois was born in 1868, five years following the Emancipation Proclamation, to Alfred and Mary Savina Du Bois. Du Bois' family was one of few black families in his predominantly white hometown of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Recalling the beginnings of his lifelong battle with racism in a collection of essays and sketches titled The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois revisited a class activity in his childhood his childhood elementary classroom that was intended to cultivate a welcoming environment for new students by presenting them with welcome cards. In this particular reflection, Du Bois recounts his interaction with a young white female who refused him and his efforts altogether. In that moment, he realized that a vast veil excluded him from a world that whites occupied. Du Bois further includes that, instead of posing the question, how does it feel to be the problem directly? He noted that whites often frame races, their racism th among niceties and supposed concerns. For instance, a senior white professor might say to a black junior professor, Shannon, oh, she's nice and also articulate and a black professor. 
you two should really get along. Despite these and other racial obstacles, Du Bois went on to become the first African American to graduate from his then, at, his then predominantly white high school. Despite Du Bois's desire to attend Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts after high school, the lack of financial resources prevented him from doing so. With the assistance of members in his church and the encouragement from teachers and family, he attended Fisk University, a private historically black college located in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, because of the education he received in Massachusetts, Du Bois entered Fisk in 1885 as a 17-year-old sophomore. Throughout his tenure at Fisk as a student and postgraduate instructor, Du Bois encountered two worlds, one in which he was seen as a man and fellow citizen, and the other in which he was often viewed and portrayed as subhuman. On campus, he was immersed in a haven of black culture and excellence, including becoming a member of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. However, beyond the walls of Fisk stood a vastly different reality daily occurrences of white terrorism against black bodies and communities. From 1885 to 1894, in addition to the scores of mutilations and sexual assault crimes committed against African Americans, approximately 1,700 lynchings went unpunished in America. Following his completion of a Bachelor's of Arts in Fisk in 1888, Du Bois attempted to enter, Harvard, to enter Harvard's graduate program. However, because Harvard deemed Fisk's coursework inadequate, Du Bois was not granted immediate acceptance into their graduate program. Instead, they permitted him to begin his Harvard career as a junior, embarking on yet another pursuit of a bachelor's degree. Now, in an effort to counter his loneliness and to cultivate experiences similar to those at Fisk, Du Bois set out to audition for the Harvard Glee Club. Now, hoping his vocal talent and personality would elicit a welcoming response, Du Bois was greeted with blatant racism, as his white peers indicated that they did not want a nigger on their team. These and other racial incidents shattered all hopes that Du Bois had about the North being more enlightened and progressive than the South, as both regions in this country presented black folk with inhumane and at times unbearable realities. Noticing Du Bois' struggles, two well-known American philosophers on the Harvard faculty, uh, William James and Charles Sanders Peirce, came to his aid. James later became Du Bois' mentor and friend, contributing to Du Bois completing a Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy with cum laude distinction in 1890. In 1892, shortly following his initial experience at Harvard, Du Bois was awarded a scholarship to pursue a doctorate degree at the University of Berlin, now Humboldt University in Germany. His studies included the phenomenology of consciousness, critical critique, and the philosophy of history. A pie alike in Du Bois's time in Germany to that of a romantic escape, as his experience in Europe as a black man was starkly different than his experience in America. He could come and go as he pleased while enjoying the same social activities and educational experiences as his European colleagues. Du Bois learned that, similar to how white American schools like Harvard perceived Fisk's curricula, European institutions of higher learning viewed Harvard as an unsuccessful impersonator of their college system. It was in this experience away from home that Du Bois realized that America and its so-called Negro problem were acutely unique in the world. Instead of completing his, his studies in Germany, he returned to Harvard in 1895, where he became the first African American to earn a PhD. Du Bois' educational experiences, including others that will follow, became the basis from which he constructed his double consciousness theory and the platform that would inspire the work, inspire the work of civil rights activists and critical race theorists around the world. In Souls, The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois highlighted his accounts as well as other African Americans' personal encounters with racism in America. Embedded in the first chapter was his double consciousness theory, a theoretical framework illustrating African Americans' experience of grappling with the psychosocial division of personal and social self instigated by the color line or racism a transparent yet permanent barrier separating self from the rest of the world. Du Bois also employed the idea of the veil as a metaphorical tool, dis disclosing, <clears throat> excuse me, 
disclosing African Americans wrestling with being black and becoming an American. But the two, they never consolidate, but manifest into a dual consciousness from which they must view themselves, both through their own eyes and those of whites. Du Bois articulates the following. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Tuatan and Mongolian, the Negro is sort of a seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world. A world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other worlds. It is this peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of the, of the other world, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his newness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dog strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Du Bois warned America that if it failed to act, the color line would endure. Today, over 115 years later, critical race theorists and researchers assert that not only does the color line persist, but African Americans continue to grapple with what Du Bois refers to as a peculiar sensation. <clears throat> Employing Du Bois's experiences of negotiating his path into a predominantly white higher education spaces and his theoretical model as a reflective framework, I, so, I assert that not only does the color line persist well into the 21st century, but that racism has found safe harbor in our music programs in higher education. These spaces have been often assumed, perceived, and celebrated as anti-racist and inclusive. To provide evidence of the aforementioned, I revisited a previous study where I investigated how academic, cultural, social, and racial aspects of college experience influenced degree perseverance among eight African-American men transitioning from a historically black college program, an undergraduate program, to a graduate music program at a predominantly white institution. Data revealed that when compared to challenges associated with academic, cultural, and social aspects of their undergraduate experience, race and racism played a significant role in, shaping, in the shaping of participants' experiences of their respective predominantly white graduate music programs. For this paper, I use critical storytelling as a mode of narrative inquiry to highlight how three images, the narratives of men from my study, mirror Du Bois's experience of negotiating his path into a predominantly white graduate program. Similar to, the, similar to the storytelling rationale of critical race theory, critical storytelling affords individuals a place from which to unapologetically unpack the world from their viewpoint, empowers other, empower others to do the same, and provoke actions to construct socially just and equitable power relations. Critical stories have the potential to incite deep thought about one's own participation in the world, but also from other people's viewpoint. And it has the potency, excuse me, <clears throat> the potency to influence how an individual moves forward to making the world better for other, others. Critical storytelling positions the storytelling to disclose stories so provocative and rich the reader has no choice but to wrestle with the challenges associated with realities not belonging to them. As an African-American woman, I identify deeply with the images included in this manuscript, as I too have negotiated similar experiences. Now, because of my personal connection with these narratives, coupled with the fact that black stories in music education have rarely been told by those who are members of the black community, I am compelled to undertake that responsibility of telling these stories. While participants' stories intermingle with my own as a narrative researcher, my goal for this event is to represent participants' accounts of their lived experiences, illuminate how certain truths can assist in uncovering profound, authentic narratives that have either gone, gone ignored or untold, and last, to instigate long overdue change and reform in music programs at predominantly white institutions. Carl was born in 1968, making him the oldest participant of this study. Early in his childhood, Carl's father insisted that he understand the world. Blacks have to be twice as good as white people to make it, despite the fact 
that the payoff would be half of what they deserved. This sentiment stemmed from his father's experiences of living as a black man in America and also serving in the then segregated U.S. Army. Carl participated throughout his youth in the Caldwell Youth Orchestra program as a percussionist, receiving additional instruction in music theory and oral skills and private lessons from the, from the in-house percussion teacher, Mr. Marcus. In 1980, Carl enrolled in Binder University after learning that Mr. Marcus had accepted a professorship there. He did well in all his classes and participated in a number of student organizations, including the marching band, Kappa Kappa Psi, and Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia. Carl graduated from Binder in 1984. One year after completing his undergraduate degree, Carl pursued a master's degree in percussion performance at Trapper University, a large PWI in Florida. He was one of two black students in the master's program. He was known as the black guy, as no one bothered to learn his name. During his first year, Carl quickly discovered that his, per his percussion teacher, Dr. Keaton, was not gonna help him. Each time Carl entered into his studio, Dr. Keaton would abruptly stop sharing information about upcoming events and opportunities with Carl's white percussion peers. Seeing that he was left to navigate the program alone, Carl constructed his own plan to succeed. He sought out information from peers, faculty, and by meticulously <laughs> investigating every bulletin board in the school for additional information. In the spring of his second year, he performed an incredibly challenging percussion piece at the Modern Music Festival. The same composition his professor performed prior to Carl's arrival. Not only did Carl perform the, the, the piece well, but from memory. Shortly after his performance, he realized that his professor attended all the performances of his white peers and failed to attend his. Many professors found him to be an, anom an anomaly because he was black, and he came from an HBCU. This was absolutely unheard of as being a black student and an HBCU enrolled in a reputable white program was just completely just out of the box. Because Carl was an outstanding percussionist and his work ethic was unparalleled, his professors began asking Carl about other black students he knew who might consider attending Trapper. To counter the lack of div racial diversity he experienced, Carl and some of his black graduate friends created the Black Caucus, an unofficial student organization created to provide black students a safe place to be themselves. He also walked to Prescott State University, an HBCU just across the train tracks to seek re refuge from Babylon, Carl's description of Trapper. He engaged with his Kappa Kappa Psi and Phi Mu Alpha brothers and other students who looked like him and shared similar histories as these interactions were not possible at all at Trapper. To add to the neglect Carl and many of his black peers experienced, they also witnessed white people's ignorance regularly about black history. Carl graduated with his master's in 1987. At the time of the study, Carl mentioned that he was speaking with his college age son, age son about what to anticipate upon entering into a PWI. Similar talks had been given to him by his father. Denzel, born in 1984, was 29 years old at the time of, time of the study. Through the Urban Diversity Program, an initiative aimed toward providing students, particularly black students, access into high-performing schools, Denzel attended a predominantly white middle school. While he was one of few African Americans, Denzel believes that because he was placed into this program as one of few, he was forced to learn how to deal and network with people who did not always look like him. After middle school, Denzel chose to attend an all-black high school where he participated in choir and band. Combined with his interest in learning as well as his parents' expectations of him, Denzel knew he was going to go to college. In 2002, because he was awarded academic and music scholarships that fully funded his education, Denzel chose to attend Hawkins University, a large HBCU in a large urban city in Tennessee. Now, unlike other men in this paper, Denzel initially began his undergraduate career as a biology major. He participated in the concert and marching band, and despite HU, HU being labeled as a party school, Denzel believed it took great strides to cultivate a sense of community and belonging among its students. In addition to participating in music ensembles, 
He was also a member of Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia. Many of his music professors, including Dr. Galway, the black marching band director, supported Denzel and encouraged him to pursue his passion for music by performing in ensembles and taking private, private lessons while trying to complete his biology degree. The faculty made such an impact on Denzel that he not only completed his biology degree, but he returned to pursue a second bachelor's degree in music education, graduating in 2009. In the following year, Denzel entered the Master of Music Education program at Greenwood University, a large PWI in Alabama. Despite not being offered a graduate assistantship, he chose to attend this school largely because Dr. Galway, also an alum, spoke highly about the quality music program. Only one African-American professor was in the School of Music. Among five African-American students in the School of Music, Denzel was the only full-time graduate student and the only African-American in all his classes. Given that Denzel enjoyed learning from others by observing them teach, he attended every rehearsal when his schedule permitted. Taking notice of Denzel's work ethic and interest, the director of the marching band offered him a graduate assistantship that would pay for most of his college costs. After learning of his assignment to the concert band as a, as a graduate assistant, with excitement, he quickly reached out to, through emails to the two other white graduate assistants assigned to the same ensemble to start planning for the following semester. He received absolutely no response from them. Similar to other participants in this study, the two GAs only made score copies for themselves. They also excluded Denzel from all correspondence pertaining to the concert band and sometimes falsified information in emails as their goals was to tarnish his reputation and have him withdraw from the program. To counter what Denzel perceived as racism, he purchased his own scores and set out to work even harder. Not only did he excel as a graduate assistant, but he earned all A's in all of his classes. Some of his white peers refused to accept the fact that a black HBCU graduate could, su could surpass them. Other white peers regularly interrogated him about his former teachers and what he did prior to attending Greenwood, as they believed Denzel was out of place. In a study group, one white male peer cornered Denzel saying, are you really trying to make us look bad? The professor never returns any of your assignments and you always turn them in early. While the students tried to appear as though he was joking, Denzel knew better, he was serious. In response to his experience at Greenwood, Denzel shared the following. In my mind, I always thought that in music, it didn't matter if you were black or white. Everyone could just sit down and enjoy a piece of music and talk about it. And you didn't have to worry about people judging you and talking about you, you could just enjoy it. I never thought that going into situations like that, you had to think of people doing stuff like that to you or treating you like that, and they don't even know you. That's the thing that really killed me. They were thinking that I'm coming to take away what they have. Jonathan was born in 1987, making him the youngest participant at the time of the study. Because of his father's military career, his family moved to a new state every three years. Jonathan encountered one of the most disappointing experiences while attending an elementary school in Florida. Not only was he placed in special education, but he was often demeaned by his third grade teacher who regularly called him stupid. She believed that he was dumb and would never amount to anything. In another instance, the same teacher constantly scolded another young black boy because of how he spelled his name, even though he spelled it correctly. While Jonathan did not understand why he and other black boys were treated differently by his teacher, he had some idea that it was related to the way he looked. After relocating to another state, Jonathan was all of a sudden the smartest kid in the class. This particular memory of his past prompted a brief discussion by Jonathan about Carter Woodson's The Miseducation of the Negro. According to Jonathan, this book not only validated his feelings of frustration, but it gave him license to have resentment about his primary school experiences. Now, in his predominantly white high school, Jonathan participated in everything. The marching band, concert band, all of the jazz bands, all in which he earned first chair. 
While he sought to become a section leader in the marching band, he was denied the opportunity because his white band director believed that another student who was also white deserved the opportunity to, the opportunity to lead, despite the fact that the student did not possess the same music skills or leadership abilities. Jonathan realized that sometimes the world will not always decide in your favor, even when you deserve it. After graduating from high school, Jonathan sought to find a university that could offer him a vastly different experience than that of his high school experience. In 2006, Jonathan enrolled in the undergraduate music program at Sumter Tech University, an HBCU in a small town in Alabama. According to Jonathan, only seven white and even fewer international students attended Sumter Tech. There was only a handful of white professors. Now, Jonathan enjoyed Sumter <clears throat> and having the opportunity to connect with so many different black students. Because of his exceptional musical skills, Jonathan was awarded a full scholarship. In addition, because of his enlistment into the National Guard after high school, he was able to pay for books and other expenses using tuition assistance and the GI Bill. Due to Jonathan's outstanding musicianship and ability to quickly learn new concepts, Mr. Nettle, the marching band director who was also black, provided him with opportunities to lead the band, including arranging music that the band would perform on the field. Outside of his classes and ensembles, Jonathan actively participated in New Row Sigma, the Negro Philharmonic Society of Historically Black Students, and Alpha Phi Alpha. After graduation in 2011, Jonathan pursued a master's degree in saxophone performance at Stinton University, a PWI located in a large city in Tennessee. Now, initially, Jonathan assumed that all of the students would be far smarter and far more advanced than him, but to his surprise, he kept up with his peers. In jazz band, however, he struggled a little bit. He discovered that he would have to spend some time in the practice room. However, his peers, mostly white, cruised through the rehearsals as many of them came from well-known performance schools throughout the United States. While he knew that at SU, he would no longer be a part of a majority black population, he was shocked to realize that the entire jazz faculty were all white and that he was the only, he was one of three black graduate students in the School of Music. In addition to the sparse number of black students and the competitive culture of the school, Jonathan struggled to find students to spend time with. In comparison to STU, Stinton was not and did not encourage creativity. He, he was also discarded by one of his white professors who told him that he had given up on him. Jonathan offered a critique of that school and their objectives by stating the following. Honestly, the faculty and student populations were very goal-oriented. If you weren't much help to where they were trying to go, they didn't have much to say to you. That was a way that they took the joy out of making music. In the end, Stinton just stripped me of all I wanted to do in music. I became a better sax player, but not, not the way that I wanted to. Many of Jonathan's graduate experiences contributed to a mental breakdown he experienced. He concluded that if he had to do it all over again, he would not choose to attend SU. Although Jonathan graduated in 2013, he shared with me in his last interview in 2014 that he was still in the process of recovering what Stinton took from him. Now in the next three slides, I will talk about the reflections that that were created by placing Du Bois and these three African-American men in front of this infinity mirror and how racism, gone unchecked, has created these reflections. So the first reflection is the pre-college experiences. Similar to Du Bois, most participants' introduction to racism manifested early in their childhood as racialized encounters instigated by whites and also forewarnings, forewarnings shared by parents. While Du Bois and the participants were not able to fully articulate why these challenges occurred then, reflecting back as men, they were confident in identifying the intent of each racist incident. I speculate that this may be due in part to participants acquiring tools such as resistant capital to negotiate racist encounters over time, including their graduate PWI experience. Jonathan's 
and other participants, white teachers regularly taunted them and other black students. Along with other black boys at his elementary school, Jonathan was placed in special education without any sort of rationale why. After transferring to another school, he was the smartest kid in his class. Assigning black students, particularly boys, to special education without any reason was one of many examples how whites disguised institutional racism in, as progressive approaches in education. Jonathan's and his peers' experiences parallel with Carter's, Carter Woodson's proven hypothesis about how strategies of cultural indoctrination were employed throughout America's education system to purposefully control how blacks saw themselves and to further slow their progress of obtaining an equal education. Such practices, which continue today, prohibited black students from realizing their full potential. Now, participants' experiences here mirror Du Bois' depiction in souls of how blacks are often confronted with episodes of being seen as the problem. According to Du Bois, black folk are born into twoness, where the veil, a barrier of exclusion, only permits them to see the other world from afar. I speculate that most black Americans begin negotiating a peculiar sensation as early as childhood. Because the first episode of racism can be so traumatic and awkwardly unfamiliar, black folks have no choice but to recall its fine details and devastating impact. For example, I was in kindergarten when I realized that I could not fully participate in the world that my white classmates enjoyed daily. After completing a hand painting activity, and we've, we've all done them, several of my, white, of my female peers and I were sent to the restroom to wash our hands. Like most children, we played around long before we washed our hands. I jokingly acted like I was going to place my paint-filled hands on a white classmate. I did not, but my jovial movements made everyone laugh except her. She ran to our teacher with a, a false story, who was also white, Instead of listening to my side of the story, she beat me with a meter stick that day. By the way, the color of the paint used that day was red. To provide his son with insight on how best to navigate a world that fundamentally favored whites, Carl's father pressed upon his son to understand that he would not always receive honest pay for honest hard work because of the color of his skin. According to Hacker, black parents, unlike their white counterparts, must pass on this information to their children to ensure not only their survival, but their making sense of the world. Hacker states, there will be the perplexing and equally painful task of having to explain to your children why they would not be treated as other Americans, that they will never be altogether accepted, that they will always be regarded warily, if not with suspicion or hostility. When they ask whether or not this happens because of anything they have done, you must find ways of conveying that no, it is not because of any fault of their own. Further, for reasons you can barely understand yourself or explain, you must tell them that much of the world has decided that you are not and cannot be their equals, that this world wishes to keep you apart, a caste it will neither absorb nor assimilate. You will tell your children that this world is wrong, but because that world is there, they will have to struggle to survive with the scales weighted against them. They will have to work harder and do better, yet the result may be less recognition and reward. We all know that life can be unfair. For black people, this knowledge is not an academic theory, but a fact of daily life. The disappointment Jonathan experienced in high school resulting from his white band director overlooking his hard work and skill set to promote a white student with lesser quality supports Hacker's point about how whites will be rewarded no matter their deficiencies. Participants' early bouts with racism mirror Du Bois's double consciousness theory by highlighting how black folks are, are introduced to a world that not only looks at them in amused, con amused contempt and pity, but one that in many cases seeks to establish its dominance early on. Participants' HBCU experiences were mostly positive, excluding experiences like traveling off campus. Now, these experiences mirrored Du Bois's Fisk experiences of negotiating two worlds, on campus and off campus. While one world permanently etched painful memories of trauma and violence into Du Bois's consciousness, the other world 
presented a counter narrative of intellectual fortitude and cultural pride. During their HBCU experiences, participants were immersed in an environment that encouraged and celebrated black student interactions and identity, as opposed to their experiences at PWIs. Discussed in the following re reflection, students immediately felt welcomed and included in their classes as well as campus culture. Participants found that their respective institutions provided social spaces where they and other students could fellowship and interact with one another and just be black. In the marching band, they formed strong friendship and family bonds with other students that continue today. Additionally, participants joined Greek and music organization, further extending their bonds of friendship and fraternal ties with other young black men. <clears throat> While Du Bois is noted to be one of the most famous members of Alpha Phi Alpha, he did not become a member until 1909, three years after it was established and seven years after earning his PhD. Although many professors now um, were strict and demanded greatness, participants appreciated their tough love and commitment to every student, as both of these things motivated them to succeed, work hard, and to give back to the black community. These findings align with research examining African Americans' undergraduate experiences at HBCUs and how these schools aim to cultivate a culture of care, belonging, and empowerment as a collective hallmark, hallmark of student success. Connecting with the latter, black students at HBCUs are more engaged in campus and classroom culture than their black peers at attending PWIs. As faculty members regularly encourage students to assume leadership roles and welcome them to engage in collaborative learning projects. This was certainly true for Jonathan, as his professors not only supported and mentored him, they encouraged him to assume leadership roles and to work alongside them in arranging tunes his peers would later perform. Scholars assert that these and other assets and opportunities offered at HBCUs geared toward emboldening cultural competence and self-efficacy incite motivation among students to succeed academically. Dissimilar to their pre-college and PWI experiences in the following reflections, Du Bois's and the participants' HBCU experiences, excluding those taking place off campus, reverberated mirrored images free of racial discrimination, racial injury, and exclusion. The last reflection, graduate PWI experiences. When compared to their HBCU experiences, African Americans negotiate a starkly different campus terrain and climate at PWIs. Some experiences included, but are not limited to racism, exploitation, and isolation. These challenges are often compounded in graduate study at PWIs due to a lack of black student support, and sparse representations of black students, faculty, and administrators. However, participants reported that they regularly encountered racism from their white peers and professors. Several of, several of Denzel's and other participants' white male classmates attempted many times to sabotage their success and reputation in their programs. Not only was one participant not welcomed by most of his peers, he was isolated and alienated by his own fraternity brothers. From physically cornering him to intentionally excluding him from important correspondence to fabricating emails, Denzel's white peers purposefully sought out to intimidate him, hoping he would drop out. In addition, they constantly questioned his legitimacy and presence in the program. This mirrors the cynicism and racism that Du Bois and other participants face upon entering to their PWIs. Instead of embracing the knowledge and skills he, that he brought with him from his HBCU, Cause white professors dismissed him completely. Cause professors' failure to embrace or acknowledge his skills parallel with Yoso's work about how some individuals' knowledge and cultural capital is often dismissed by those whose capital is largely celebrated in majority white spaces. Denzel's frustration in response to the racism and white fear he encountered aligns with that of Du Bois. Du Bois states, the American Negro would not Africanize America for America has too much to teach the world in Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. 
To many of his peers and professors, Carl was just simply that, that black guy from that school. Only after noticing his exceptional work ethic and musical abilities did Carl's professors begin to take interest. Their interest did not result in them celebrating or embracing him, but instead a desire to further their own agendas to exploit Carl and other prospective black HBC music, music students. In addition, Carl's assumption about white people's negligence in black history was often confirmed. These views, excuse me, one participant professor's broad categorizing of black youth coupled with his devaluing of predominantly black schools illuminated his racist narrow views about black people. These views align with what critical race scholars have often <clears throat> articulated as essentialism, a belief that all people perceived to be in the single group think, act, and believe the same things in the same ways. Such assumptions can be dangerous and may possibly result in violence or death. Many whites, particularly white women, have been noted to fabricate narratives based on essentialized views to frame black people, especially black men and boys as criminal predators. In 1955, a white woman's false story resulted in the ruthless murder of Emmett Lewis Till, a 14-year-old black boy. Similar essentialized black stories continue today that have resulted in police brutality, incarceration, and or death. Jonathan, the youngest participant at the time of the study, also encountered harsh realities, including being told by his supply studies professor that he had given up on him. Similar to the motivations that, of Carl's professors, Jonathan's music program only aimed to use him for their advancement. His goals and perspectives were not of their concern. He felt trapped in a space that simultaneously bolded emboldened a culture of competitiveness and sameness while discouraging di creativity and other music viewpoints. Jonathan also anticipated not being able to keep up with his white peers. Perhaps earlier disheartening experiences such as those he experienced in elementary school might provide clarity as to why Jonathan perceived himself to be inferior. This mirrors Du Bois' experiences of wrestling with how racism and its pervasive nature deep in self-doubt. Carl was the only participant who sought out and constructed safe spaces for himself and other black students like him on campus and at a nearby HBCU. For other participants, this was not possible, including Du Bois. Their safe spaces were often within the confines of their living quarters. Like Du Bois, every participant faced blatant racism and oppressive structures that made their experiences at PWIs incredibly difficult. These, these experiences, resemblances, they resemble present and present uncanny reflections of the voices, so much so that if certain qualifiers such as name, time, and place were removed, it would be difficult to distinguish which story or fragments of participant stories belong to whom and in what century. While participants successfully obtained their graduate degrees, render reflections of Du Bois suggest that none of them absolutely none of them escaped their respective PWI without racial injury. This is true of Jonathan as the trauma he endured resulted in a mental breakdown. I speculate that every participant continues to navigate a world and profession that underwrites and resounds mirrored images of a peculiar sensation. While I pause here, the last slide alludes to suggestive measures that I will share in our talk following Stacy's presentation of his work about how predominantly white music programs, including the ones here at Illinois, should work to dim the light of racism by dismantling their own racist culture from within. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. So much to think about, so much to unpack, and I have <laughs> So many questions <laughs> that I want to ask sure. you. Um, but I want us to take a moment, reflect on the past and the present injustices mm -hmm. that you've brought up. But I want us to move now to the, the future and the next. And we'll couch the now in between the two. Next, we'll talk to Stacy Robinson who is a graphic artist 
And he is a professor of art and design here at the University of Illinois. Stacy is also the creator of our beautiful um, banner and logo that you see for the We Got Next project. So Stacy, please tell us a little bit about yourself and, and take us into the future and the sure, next. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, I think that you said the basics of what I wanted to say, and I want to get right into talking about what next looks like. Great. <laughs> awesome. And I think that will, what I'm about to read will contextualize the work in a particular way. First of all, um, thank you to our viewing audience. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here. Let me start by saying I believe that we are uniquely placed in our time. We are circa 100 years post the First World War, the Spanish flu, Red Summer, Next year is the 100 year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. We are 90 years from the Great Depression and the highest unemployment rate in America until now. We are also in an, in an election year, with many of us battling the re-election of arguably the worst president in American history, who ironically is also many Americans' perceived savior. Joyously, we're also circa 95 years post the Harlem Renaissance. In the summer of 2020, of perfect vision, our 401st year since landing in Jamestown, Virginia, I'm reflective of the last year I spent, partly the year of the return, at Harvard University under the tutelage of Henry Louis Gates Jr., Skip, Cornell West, and in the company of many profound Hutchins Center fellows who gave me enough resources to explore the depths of my own visual art practice literally for the rest of my life. I've been thinking about this in tandem with one of my favorite expressions. I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. I thought about the undocumented black people who built Harvard, the generations that came later who were admitted to the university, to then, to, be, to then be rejected by their white classmates who could, with the simplest of complaints, enact the dismissal of black students. I'm also thinking about the African American Studies Department on campus, with this past February marking the 50th anniversary of the department. I can only imagine that there were undocumented ancestors building, surviving, and foreseeing me <laughs> me there as a visual artist exploring black cultural wealth through the elements of hip hop culture as a foundational functioning constitution of black liberation when we are not awarded the reparations we, we of course deserve. That would truly be the wildest of dreams. I recognize that I too stand on the shoulders of W.E.B. Du Bois whose double consciousness we carry as an advancing technology because we don't have the luxury of singular vision. In this time, I am, most reflect, I am mostly reflective of how grateful I am for the quarantine. Not the COVID, but the quarantine. I am very sad, angry, and inspired by the many we've lost in this time. My condolences to the many of you who have lost loved ones. This century marker where many of us are working from home is not, only, is not ideal for many of us. It is reflective of the privilege that many of us carry. The essential workers we celebrate over those with less glamorous occupations, the ones we disregard. Yet, this quarantine is an opportunity where we've explored the depths of ourselves. As I am following our navigation of this time, many of us are learning to love ourselves through self-care, taking care of our inner and outer selves. For example, going natural with our hair, cooking and sharing healthy recipes, sharing workout routines, and forming allyship with many who, in many other times, would disregard our screams for justice. I fear we are soon returning to those days as phase four and fives 
have released many from the burden of the quarantine viewing of America's inequities. What I am mostly affectionately passionately, mostly affect, most affectionately passionate about is the arts movement that is happening right now and how black art is specifically placed. Whether it's DJ D Nice and Club Quarantine and the, and the inspiration to many other DJs who have performed live after that, Timberland and Swiss Beats Versus series, and the millions who have gotten dressed up for a virtual concert of their favorite songwriters. Or the live sessions of one of my new best friends, Shawana Davis, whose IG platform, Be Beautiful LA, celebrates black women and self-care through live art making section, sessions, uh, product reviews, and ocean shore prayers for loved ones that get washed away by the tide. All of this while sharing the dopest playlist from artists we've, you've never heard of. Her virtual events are accompanied with words like healing, joy, and life. Even my high school classmate Nathan Frank, aka DJ Nate the Great, conducts a daily focus session to help people tap into their daily tasks through mental exercises, compassion for self, and healing and focus on tasks set for the day while spinning music and sonic resonances that help us address our particular needs. Even as a white DJ, he recognizes the power of mostly, the mostly black music he plays. In short, black art specifically is saving us right now. With that, we are uniquely placed in a time post many black freedom movements. The black arts movement, Afrocentricity, black power, and more that are the foundations of our speculative futures. What I mean by this is that in our very recent past, our forebears pioneered the gathering of our black history. She got to Diop, Chancellor Williams, John Henry Clark, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, and many, many more, decades ago gathered, argued, and proved the black origin of civilization. So we have our history. In our unique setting of the present, we have arguably more access to technology than in any other time in world history. The average teen and young adult is having conversations concerning gender, age, and identifications through facial alteration apps like Snapchat several times a day. They can imagine themselves as elderly, differently gendered, differently abled, and even gene splice to become someone transhuman, to name a few. We also are in a time coined Afrofuturism and, and the black speculative where art, literature, music, and various other media centers ideas of black futures. With this, I believe our, our generation is uniquely equipped to plan our own liberated, equitable futures. The following images that you will see are a curated set of illustrations from the last five years that give a thorough understanding of how I'm theorizing, thinking about, and imagining black liberated futures. You'll see images signed Black Kirby, which is the moniker of me and my best friend and collaborator John Jennings, who as a collaborative duo, we imagine black comic culture through a politicized lens while celebrating, analyzing, and critiquing the work of the godfather of comics, Jack Kirby. You will see collage Im images reminiscent of one of my chief inspirations, Romare Bearden. Building upon the legacy, I am uh, building upon his legacy, I'm imagining that we are imagining us as black deities, what, what we look like as black deities through sacred geometry, popular culture, and hip-hop remixing. You'll see the influence of popular culture on politics and vice versa through Star Trek and, civil, and the civil rights movement. Wait for that. <laughs> You'll see my collaboration with my very good friend, Kamau Grantham, 
cl clinical psychologist, DJ, and collage artist who I have many odd, oddly unique overlaps with. Before you view those images, let me speak about the piece you are, you've been viewing on screen for the last several minutes. This image is one of my beginning visual experiments of, of what to me next looks like. After this, the images you will see will contextualize how I think about the vehicles in which we get to next. Once upon a time called right now, Next looks like mining our own historical contributions to world culture, our, our own untold stories through feature-length film, animation, comics, music projects, and et cetera. We are, we are already doing all of these things and have been for many, many years. But I think we will soon see new mediums for black storytelling with more, much more frequency. Next looks like finally defining what blackness is outside the confines of white supremacy and racism. Next looks like defining our liberation as thoroughly as white supremacy and racism is constructed, meaning a black liberation system that works in tandem with state and local government, taught through primary education, enforced through our justice system, protected by our police, and prophesized, prophet, pro, proselytized through our religious orders. Next looks like the decolonized black imagination that can only exist in the minds of artists like Earth, Wind, and Fire when they imagined our voices ring, will ring together until the 12th of never. We all will live forever as one. And when they sang, bring your mind to everlasting liberty, our minds will explore together old worlds we conquer forever. We then will expand love together as one. These old lands are our own history stolen, our narratives erased, our gods replaced, our sciences colonized, and our minds hypnotized. Next looks like the promised land that we also will see when we stand in the footprints of Reverend Dr. King who looked over the mountaintop and saw the promised land as our ancestral Hebrew foreparents did. Next looks like commandeering our own brilliance without asking white people for permission to be great. Next looks like commandeering our own brilliance without asking white people for permission to be great. Next, looks like commandeering our own brilliance without asking white people for permission to be great. Next looks like not quantifying that we don't hate white people when we shout black is beautiful. I love black people and I will, I will only marry another black person. Next looks like working on the other side of time where we are not constantly responding to the distraction of white, race, of white supremacy and racism as tactics that work to disrupt our liberation plans. Next looks, like, next looks like Larry LeVan and a Paradise Garage as a self, as a, a, uh, a safe space for marginalized cultures through the sonic resonance of house music as black healing. As P-Funk stated, whatever ails you, put it on your radio. The funk doesn't only move, it can remove. Next looks, look, next looks like black men and women not feeling like we are in contest for the bottom tier of a functioning patriarchal social ladder that black men didn't create either. Next looks like black men saying to other black men, I love you, not I got love for you, dog without saying pause. There will be no pause in our love for each other. Love is not an, 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 an <laughs> love is not an inanimate object, and I am not a dog. Quite the reverse of that spelling, when next looks like us acknowledging that we are made in the image and likeness of God. So not only do we look like God, 
But we are like God as much as our children are like us. Same power, same attributes, same potentials, unapologetically. Next looks like black healing for us and by us, coming home to us every day to heal each other and to better tomorrows. Therefore, next looks like Stevie Wonder's ass when he says, I'll be loving you until we dream of life and life becomes a dream. And when he says, change your world into truth, then change that truth into love. And maybe our children's grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren will tell, I'll be loving you. Or when he says, until dear, until dear Mother Nature says, her work is through, until the day that you are me and I am you. Next looks like not sacrificing love, family, and fantasies for the building of black freedom. Next looks like the revolutionary tactics of Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman, and Denmark Vesey, the founder of Emmanuel AME Church. Next looks like defending our foundational religious homes from terrorists from terrorist before the police come, poli peacefully arrest him with a protective vest on, but before the arrest, treat him to Burger King for a job well done. Next looks like the realization I had just only 30 days ago when I realized I wasn't scared to die and that the freedom of thought, planning, and overstanding for applicable imaginings and theorizations while simultaneously not losing the exploration of tangible futures through black inspirational abstraction. Next looks like black gun ranges and weapons proficiency and preparation for the war before the peace. I'd rather protect my home from terrorist attacks with the appropriate weaponry than try to appeal to terrorists with our own sense of morality and ethics that they do not share. As a reminder, Jesus' disciples carry swords. And as Toby Nwigwi said, try Jesus, don't try me, I throw hands. Next looks like planting our own gardens without genetically processed Monsanto seeds. Next looks like capturing and capitalizing on our own cultural wealth that we've given to the world. Next looks like a black space program. When white people are investing trillions into leaving, what poisonous environment are they going to leave here with us? I don't honestly expect us to peacefully part ways. Next looks like understanding Afrofuturism through the right inquiries. Theori uh, theories that address the who, when, why, what, and how of black futures beyond the cool black aesthetics of fashion and sound. Next looks like transforming black on black crimes to black on black rhymes, to nation time and seizing the time. Next looks like James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Next looks like the series of Baldwin pieces I'm working on currently, possibly titled The Black Fist Fire This Time. As the time he was speaking of 57 years ago is prophetically and non-distinguishable from today. Next looks like my upcoming seri series, Opulent Rage and the Tangibility of Black Abstraction, where I'm looking at, where I'm imagining what black rage looks like aesthetically, while conversing the need for white people to always physically touch us. We can't be segregated from them without our communities being physically destroyed. Yet we can't be integrated with them without our bodies being physically destroyed. What does, a fa what does a fascination with worshiping, touching, and destroying God, whom you live with, yet can't live apart from, look like? 
Finally, next looks like the black artist, next looks like black artists not having to grapple with the contentions of only making political art. Because we can venture the ideas of being black and artistically exploratory outside the confines of visualizing black trauma and fights for freedom. This first slide is a Black Kirby piece. It's one of 12 in a series of billboard images that I created uh, for a SEPA gallery in Buffalo, New York. And here I was commissioned to create 12, uh, 12 billboards that converse with the community. I pitched the idea of a series called Black Matters. This piece right here is called Black Family Matters. Other pieces um, in the series is Black Education Matters, Black Justice Matters, Black Joy Matters. And this, this is the first you're hearing of this. This project hasn't even been announced yet. Um, but th those pieces are being installed and uh, throughout East Buffalo right now. You will be able to view all of the, po uh, the billboards online. This next piece is a piece from 2015 where I'm talking about the connections between Nichelle Nichols and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Treat yourself to, view, uh, to viewing her interview where she talks about her connection on YouTube. You can see this on YouTube. But in short, uh, Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek, the, the, um, the first series, Generation One series, Nichelle Nichols quit after the first year. She then went to a dinner party <laughs> when she, where she met her greatest fan, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who explained to her her importance of being the first black woman in space, and we could then see ourselves in the, in the future. Ironically, Lieutenant Uhura on a Star Trek series is a communication officer. More than a glorified receptionist, the Star Trek team cannot communicate with the alien life unless they go through her first. I don't think this was explored enough in the series, but I would love for you to take the time to explore um, what this conversation in this piece is also looking at, but what the potential of that is through the interview that she gave and what is also missing from that Star Trek series. Ironically, after that conversation, Nichelle Nichols stayed on the show for all six seasons. But in this piece, you see um, Lieutenant Ohura conversing with Dr. King as they are about to enter the atmosphere of sunrise Saturn. Notice the red, black, green, and yellow Pan-African um, uh, Starship Enterprise. So sure. I'd love for you to go through your the slides because I want everyone to see all of the beautiful work you've done. Mm -hmm. But if you could go through with a little, you want me to go quicker? A little sure. quicker. All right. This next piece is um, a portrait of MF Doom, my favorite rapper, and this is a collage piece that inspired that looks at um, um, MF Doom as the uh, in the origin story of him as he became a rapper, a new artist, uh, formerly known as uh, Zev Love X. And this piece is inspired to think about uh, black nationhood through collage and the inspiration of Romare Bearden. This next piece, uh, called The Prison Industrial Complex, looks at how by the third and fourth grade, we, uh, we can tell, and the prison industry can also tell who will be, quote, candidates uh, for prison occupation in the future and how those prisons are corporately controlled and they're uh, uh, populated with mostly black and brown bodies. This next piece is a piece I created for a... Um, a cur a, I curated, uh, co-curated um, for a, 
an exhibition called Curating the End of the World, which looks at and speculates um, our current COVID situation. This piece is called Revelation 16 and 1, where there's an angel pouring out the wrath of God upon the earth. This next piece is called The Harbinger. This imagines a, a black woman as an angel bringing liberation and black power justice through her crown, but also carrying uh, sacred geometry as a message to black people. And is that the la that is, and this last slide here is a piece that, uh, that Kamau Grantham and I created uh, for our, our very first season, uh, pardon me, our very first season uh, series, and we are, as a collaborative team, called Black Mal. This piece is looking at um, black revolution through pan-Africanism uh, as a global resistance, and our fight against police brutality as these figures are cross, uh, crossing the uh, police barrier, but we are also bringing revolution with us. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, in listening to you, I have to say that next is social filters off, clearly. Um, you went right there with your thoughts and with what we've experienced. And I would love for you to, to go ahead and go there some more in this safe space of being able to talk about um, things that affect us things that we need to dismantle, um, how the past, which was um, full of hypervisibility, invisibility, oppression and suppression, how we're dismantling those things to move into the next. Yes, I will definitely continue that. There's a lot more work coming, <laughs> a lot more work coming. Yes, yeah. thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. So Joyce, I would like to ask you right now, though, um, you mentioned in your presentation how it is a responsibility of PWIs to self-assess and self-reflect. Mm. Um, and I'm assuming that is on race and the lack of diversity. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what that would look like? And how have you addressed that working in a predominantly white institution? So I guess responding to the first part of your question and how PWIs would respond and self-reflect and what that would look like. Um, I think in the earlier talk in the College of Arts and Letters, one of the, the questions that I posed is like, well, instead of the, the easy questions, we need to shoot for more, more robust questions that can potentially cause silence. Mm -hmm. So an example of what that might be would be this question. Besides a college degree, what other benefits uh, do, or racially minoritized populations, what other benefits do they get from attending a PWI during their experience and after they graduate? Mm -hmm. And I've actually asked more than beyond this institution when I visit and consult with other universities, th that is a question that I ask. And so far, no one has been able to, to respond immediately. And I think part of that is because, in many ways, PWIs do not want to put, position themselves in the worst possible light, mm -hmm. right? So, <clears throat> but in those questions, those robust questions, that's where the anti-racist agenda or perspectives begin, I think, begin to emerge because it puts these institutions in the space where they have no choice but to answer those questions. And perhaps maybe something else, I mean, in terms of what it could look like in another way is confronting this diversity, <laughs> this diversity rationale mm -hmm. and how PWIs use that as a means to diversify their campuses. But according to research and according to my experiences and the black students who are in our spaces now, um, that diversity rationale is very much moot because the diversity rationale only recenters whiteness, where white students come to these schools when we, we literally 
pluck out these students of color from various places like Chicago, and we tell them to come to an institution like Illinois or any of the schools in the Big Ten, and we say we welcome them here, but we don't think about inclusion, right? So what typically happens is that white students are further educated about various cultures. They are prepared to enter into a diverse workforce, a global community. They are able to become more tolerant and informed of, of our culture and various cultures around the world. But what does that look like for students of color? So you're saying we are, with the push towards diversity, we bring black students in, we situate them amongst white students, mm -hmm. and then what? Nothing. <laughs> we drop them off, and it's, this, it's this, the assumption, right, that if they made it to college, that they're the typical college student, that they would come in and they would just roll through and be able to negotiate and navigate and have these cognitive maps. Many of our students who come through the School of Music when we look at particularly black students, um, while they have the skills, like musically, they're very talented, they're very gifted, but to navigate an institution that is highly structured around white supremacy or framed within white supremacy, but to also navigate a world outside of this space that simultaneously views them as insignificant, and we don't acknowledge that, it, it's like, well, what are we doing? Why are we here? But we, the black students, at least the ones who I've, I've spoken with here, just in my two years of being here, they feel very abandoned. You know, like they thought they were coming here for more than just music. Mm. They were coming here, they are coming here for experiences. They're coming here to, to engage in possibly relationships that that should extend long beyond their graduation year, right? They should be able to reach across the aisle and engage in the same way for other students of color. But their understanding of what that could look like is not possible. So I, I, I really believe that predominantly white institutions have to move beyond those starting points. It's, it seems like we're too often at the starting point. I can't tell you how many conferences, how many conversations, people say, oh, this is, this is a wonderful starting point. And perhaps it is, but we've been at a starting point since the Emancipation Proclamation, Reconstruction, Brown versus Board of Education, and the list goes on. And so I, we are ready, black folk, I know in America, we are ready to move to the next thing and the next thing because we're behind. You know, when we look at Harvard, established in 1636. The first HBCU was established in 1837. So it's like this 200 year difference. Um, and as far as myself in trying to, I guess, assist in this reimagining and self-reflection, um, in my time here, I've, I've been pushing my white colleagues uh, in a very honest way. I, I, I think now is not the time to, to sugarcoat anything right. because there's, there's so much at risk. We should move with a sense of urgency because there is a sense of urgency. It's always been a sense of urgency for us and perhaps some of our white co colleagues in this country have realized that sense of urgency, but a good chunk of them have not. So th those are some of the things, what that could look like in terms of reflection and self-critique, but also after you do that, we have to self-correct. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. We know, we know all of these things. I think we know majority of the, of the problem. But it's like, well, okay, if we know this, it's like, if you know better, do better as a kid. You know, your grandma, grandma probably said, oh, if you know better, you do better. So I think that's the same sort of, as a matter of fact, approach we should, we should have in, in our work in predominantly white institutions. So we're no longer accepting of the, I didn't know. That, that <laughs> is no longer an excuse that can be used. No, no. There are enough clues to absolutely clue you in that you need to, if you didn't know, you need to figure it out. Right, right. That's where the self-reflecting, that's where the self-assessment comes in. Yeah. 
and then solve some, some right. problem. And I think what the dean said is it's not our responsibility because we've carried the responsibility of educating so many people. We've carried the responsibility of making people feel comfortable around us and how we express ourselves. That, that should no longer be a thing. We should be able to move forward and be great, as, as you said in your, in your talk. So then what does education in the next look like to you? Well, <laughs> the education in the next for me looks like, um, it looks like communication. It looks like the sharing of ide ideas from let's say a predominantly white institution like Illinois and a historically black college and university. Um, and actually I'm trying to get that started through partnership between the School of Music and FAMU. And not just a one way pipeline mm -hmm. where we dominate the narrative, we dominate the agenda, but no, HBCUs have a stake in this too because they have so much to offer. Historically black colleges have been, have been sharing the, 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 they have been doing the lion's share in educating black, black folks. They, they educate annually 20% of all black students receiving a postgraduate uh, degree. And it's only 101 of them. It's over 4,800 institutions that grant, that grant degrees in this country. And so what that looks like is their partnerships. But two, it's also looking at our structures so let's say the curriculum in the School of Music is very Western art form, you know, Debus uh, Debussy, good old John Phil Sousa, we have the archives here <laughs> at Illinois. But what that also looks like is saying, well, if John Phil Sousa was doing this, who else were, what, what were the other composers of color doing at that time? Like for instance, James uh, Europe Reese, he was doing the exact same thing as John Philip Sousa, but he was actually doing more, but you never hear about that. Why? Or also confronting these composers, even John Philip Sousa, who wrote a three movement work where the titles were, so, were basically caricatures, sonic caricatures of black culture until someone called him out and then he, you know, whited it out and changed it, but it's, it's there. So I think it is, it is problematizing, it is, troubling and also being having the guts and the integrity of removing these pieces mm -hmm. that have created so much divide and so much um, oppression of other voices. So those are just a, a few things, I think. Stacy, I'm sure you have something to add to that. And can you repeat <laughs> the question, please? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what does education look like in the next? You know, I've been thinking about this in reference to many systems, right? I think that next looks like revolution and not reform. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, for example, defunding the police is revolution. Police ca uh, cameras on police uniforms that can be broken, tampered with, evidence lost is reform, right? It is, education is a system which um, enforces, as I said in my kind of manifesto of what next looks like, um, education is also backed by white supremacy and racism, as Dr. McCall pointed out with, with many, many examples, right? I believe that next looks like a full dedication to others in our communities, in our societies, and a collective um, building of an, an occupied future, right? I believe that is there are institutes that are, that I'm thinking about in, um, in the near future that imagine, um, that plan black equitable or um, fully equitable um, systems for all of us to occupy. And I think the University of Illinois is uniquely placed in the Midwest um, where our nearest uh, main cities are at least two and a half hours away. We are uniquely placed uh, to be an institute of future planning, future thinking. We have uh, the birth of the internet here. We have various other 
um, scientific discoveries and collaborations with, with um, entities that will literally change tomorrow. But I also believe that is the visualization of arts. It is the artists who have uh, the vision that usually don't have the funding <laughs> to, to execute what the future looks like, sounds like, um, tastes like, smells like, um, and, and many other things, right? I believe that is um, a revolution of that does not mean that an entire system has to be physically torn down, but the structures that um, for example, force black faculty to um, the, the obligations of black faculty to gain tenure, for example, uh, at this very prestigious institution, yet carry the weight that of, of returning to our own communities because we are the black ones who made it, right? So tenure for, for many white faculty, for example, is just working hard on their practice and, and being a great representative of, you know, of academic success. For black faculty, it is the invisible work that we do that is not recognized by our tenure process, which is the returning to our own communities, the returning to the HBCU that is not, that I graduated from an undergrad, shouts out to Fayetteville State University, Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, that is not recognized as a peer institution, right? Um, or the black speculative arts movement that is, that is, is birthed at Harris Stowe, uh, State University, um, only three and a half hours away from here in St. Louis, right? The work that I, I'm, I'm doing, uh, done there, and many of us have done there, won't be recognized in my tenure packet, but yet that work has taken me to Berlin, where I was there for the 150th anniversary or birthday of uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, right, at the Howe Theater. Um, it's taken me to Berlin, it's taken me to, to Cannes Film Festival. It's that work that I did uh, also with the HBCU and many, many other places, right? To South Africa, um, to England, et cetera. I think that the, the revolution of, of the, the a higher education um, looks like tapping into the underfunded parts of our campus who arguably have the most vision for the promise of the university. Well, we are past time. I wish I could spend more time talking with you. Um, and I want to invite people to send questions to Stacy or Joyce or myself. And I thank you for joining us tonight and thank my guest as well. And we will see you next week. Thank you.